That's an interesting topic too, divine interrogation. It's kind of a new thought. It's not something you see all the time. A very profitable topic to consider. I'll be honest that when I first heard that word interrogation, there's just some, you know, do you hear certain words, there's certain things that just kind of run through your mind off the bat because you're used to hearing the word used a certain way. When I hear interrogation, usually the first thing that just comes to my mind, I think maybe like a, someone from the law, like a policeman or whatnot, they, they question a suspect under sweat lights. That's just what I thought of off the bat. The point in such a case is to question the person with intent to get information that's either personal or secret, to discover something. But our God, he's the father of lights, and he shines the light on us. But when God shines light on something, it's seen for what it is. And also, God does not ask, as this has already been said, God doesn't ask questions in order to discover what the truth is, but to bring out what he already knows. God knows the hearts and thoughts of all men. Amen. He knows how to bring out what is hidden. All things are naked and exposed before his eyes. Nothing hidden before the eyes of God. And I'm sure you remember Job when questioning the Lord, how the Lord responded to him by asking him questions. And at the end of the Lord's response, Job put his hand over his mouth and admitted to speaking without understanding. Well, brethren, God isn't going to put his hand over his mouth. Amen. Our God does not ask foolish questions. And I'm sure you recall that we're, we're to avoid foolish and unlearned questions. Well, no such questions come from God. No question that comes from God is to be avoided. Divine interrogation consists of nothing but the right questions. And so with that being said, I anticipate hearing the remainder of the messages in this series. I'll read my main passage again, but I'll read some surrounding verses to kind of capture the thought a little better. Here in Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 20, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then, those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our main passage deals with reflecting on your past life in order to see what benefits you have gained from that time, or lack thereof. As was already pointed out, in Christ we have much better things than we did when in the world. I mean, that's what drew you in. It drew you out of the world, the things that Christ offered. However, it's important to point out that everyone who is in Christ has made some kind of transition. You have read the expression, we know we have passed from death unto life. That speaks of the transition that everyone in Christ has made. When the scriptures say, ye were dead in trespasses and sins, that's referring to all believers. When the scriptures say, like all have sinned, or when it says that you walked according to the course of this world, or that you were the children of disobedience, or that you were without strength, in all cases, they all refer to believers. Nobody here started off in Christ from the womb, so to speak. We had to make a transition. We had to go from being in darkness to being into God's marvelous light. We had, that's what we had to do to get to where we're at. We had to go from being dead to being quickened. That trans, everyone has this transition. Amen. They went from living for yourself to living for God. Everyone has made that transition. Amen. You get the point. No matter who you are, there's no exception. Everyone in Christ has had things in their past they're ashamed of. Amen. It's a dishonest for people to say, it's like, I wasn't so bad. Scratch that out of your vocabulary when you come into Christ. You were that bad. All have sinned. Enough said right there. All have sinned. You were that bad. Jesus had to die because of you. That's bad. That's bad. But you're ashamed of that now. The shame that the scriptures speak of was caused when we became new creatures in Christ Jesus. When you were born again, that sin you lived in, it didn't, sound, it didn't look so good anymore. It didn't, it didn't have like that. You weren't so attracted to that. It didn't just, it, there wasn't that urge to do it like before. In Christ, you see sin for what it is. You develop, you've actually developed you hate, a hatred for it, Amen. a hatred for things you once loved. Because you have obtained a nature like the God that you serve, you no longer like have an appetite for the things of the world. The question that I'm go going to be looking into that helps remind us why this is the case. Why do I take offense at things that I once loved? And why do I now embrace and gladly receive things that I hated in the past? This is owing to a work of God. Amen. I didn't just wake up one day and decide to love the things of the Lord. You know, this world's just getting so tiresome. I'm so bored. I'm going to try something new here. I'll, I'll try God. 
That's not how you came to love to God. I have that desire as a result of God working in me, and all other children of God can testify the same. However, we will find that although we have experienced a very evident change in Christ, and I say it is an evident change, people shouldn't be shocked when you tell them you're a believer. You go to church? You? This is, not, this, this is a bad testimony. But you can live in such a way where this isn't a shock. People look at you like, oh, I could tell you were one of those. That's, what we hear, that's why I hear at work. I, I knew you were one of those. Good. All right. You caught on. You catch on quick. Glad for that. Good. This isn't something to be discouraged by. Yes, you can see it. Amen. The light is shining. We also see that though we have that evident change, we're in process of being changed. We're not fully regenerate yet. We have a new nature, but we still have an old one to deal with too. And because of the, there's still a part in us drawn to this world, there's a temptation to go back to previous ways. All of us here have in some way a desire to like, there's this desire though in us, in a part of us, to go back to our sinful ways. So scriptures say that the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so you can't do the thing that you want. See, there's a conflict here. You got two natures wanting to go opposite directions, like not north, and one wants to go northwest, one wants to go north, and one wants to go south, or one wants to go east, one wants to go west. It's like a tearing type thing, a tearing type thing. If Paul, he spoke of the inner conflict that believers experience in Christ in Romans chapter 7. He talked about that. And we have examples of people having the real thing and then wanting to go back to the old way. Israel, very miserable in Egypt. They got delivered from the Egyptians, delivered from that bondage. And they were promised a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, sounds good. And they were sent to inhabit a land that was better than the one that were, they were in. Well, this sounded good to them. However, the Israels, they you know, like say, had some problems. They had to travel through a barren desert, so barren of food and water that God had to sustain them with manna or else they would have died. When they got to the promised land, there were a lot of inhabitants there. Well, we can't just go in and just make our way home. There's inhabitants they have to drive out of the land in order for them to claim it for their own. Not just any kind of inhabitants. There's giants. We're no match for these people. We're puny. We can't take on these big, these big tough people. We can't. So in view of these things, before, the, before then, the people conclude, let's go back. But that's, that's, that was their res resolve, a resolution for this problem. Let's, let's just go back. Go back to Egypt, the place where we were slaves. Let's go back there. The place where we were so miserable and faint that we cried out to God to deliver us from this place. Let's go back there. That's where you want to go back? God was so offended by this that he killed off that generation of Israel in the wilderness. And even there's a special chapter just committed to their remembrance in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 10. Remember them, remember them who murmured. Remember that. Remember that. Well, New Covenant, we have this kind of thing, too. This isn't just an Old Testament type thing. The Hebrew believers, the book of Hebrews, I believe Paul wrote this. They were on the right track, too, but then they were turning back to a system of law. Performing sacrifices and ceremonies. After Christ put away sins when he died on the cross, believers were going back to animal sacrifices and inferior work. Paul had to remind them of what Christ did and how he fulfilled what the prophets were foretold and how those sacrifices and ceremonies were types and shadows of what Christ would do. He had, to, he had to show them that. Christ did all of this. There is no more sacrifice for sins. Christ fulfilling those types made those sacrifices obsolete. There was no point in continuance in that. They had seen these things, but then they, they, went, they were going back. That required an immediate correction. I mean, this teaches us a lot about what flesh is like. No matter how good things get in Christ, the flesh is always going to want to go back. Yeah. Yeah. That's a desire that needs to be crucified. Amen. And amen, we have that provision. We can just crucify, we can crucify that, put that to death, but also we can think this out. Thankfully, there's some good divine reasoning to help us just arrive at our good, a right conclusion on this matter. And that, that's what we get from this question in Paul's letter to the Romans. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you were now ashamed? That is, what benefits, results, or good came from those things that you did in your past life prior to you coming into Christ? Mm -hmm. By observing the fruit, these things, will, we will see exactly why we forsook those things that came to Christ. Look at the fruit. The fruit that came from our past life always resulted in condemnation. 
Scriptures spell this out over and over again, pulling no punches. Prior to coming into Christ, you were condemned. Jesus said that those who believe not, they're damned. Well, there was a time where you didn't believe. So that was you at one time. It says the blood of Christ is said to have saved us from the wrath to come. Well, that wrath was coming for you at one time. To be blunt, outside of Christ, you're completely useless. This, I believe, is, I believe, is intended to show us the absurdity of going back to a life of sin. For a believer to go back to living for self as if no creator ever existed is total lunacy at best. Amen. The truth that the end of such thing as death is something we've already learned by experience, too. We don't have to try it out and see if this is the case. We know. I've touched the unclean thing. I know it's defiled. I've seen it. I've, t I've had the bitter taste in my mouth. I know nothing good comes from it. I've experienced it. It's who I was at one time. These are like experience. These are like results you know just for your own experience in the world. It isn't like a shocker, really. Well, let's think of it just on just going on a base level. If you touch an electric fence and you get yourself electrocuted, what are the chances of you touching that fence again? Well, if you stick your hand on a hot burn and you burn your hand, what are the chances of you doing that again? Or if you try food that's bitter tasty, do you really need to remind yourself that you don't like it? I'm sorry, to this day, from the day I tasted peach salad to this day, I still get disgusted by it. I won't, I won't eat it. I won't. It's just not, the, ta the taste is not there. Pass it to the next person, please. That's the way it goes. You get the point. Normally when you, get, you do something and you get bad result, you don't have to really be forced from not doing that thing anymore. Because you've experienced it. This is how we think in the spirit. If God's not pleased with it, why do it? Why do it? It's the same reasoning that Joseph used when Potiphar's wife tried to lure him into her bed. Like, how should I do this wicked thing and sin against God? That's, a, that's in the mindset of a believer. How shall I do that? What the, there's, he, he knew what the result of doing that thing would be. Sin against God. That's the result. So he's like, I'm not going to do it. We have other examples of people like this. Moses, when he was illuminated, he stopped being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He changed that status. He forsook Egypt. He didn't refer to that part, that part of his life anymore. He was much more willing to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He saw the fruit of the old life, and he forsook it. We forsake our old life. Paul's a good example of this as well. He touched the righteous of the law, blameless, seemed to be doing great as far as holiness is concerned. He was very zealous for the Lord in what he did, very honest in his heart, but he had zeal not according to knowledge. He persecuted the church of God, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against God's people, even consent, consented to the death of Stephen. But Paul declares he did these things ignorantly in unbelief. That's the past life. That's the old me, ignorant unbelieving. He also said he suffered the loss of all things and counted those things as dung that he might win Christ. That's the old stuff. I count all that stuff as dung. I don't have no attraction to it anymore. I don't want any part of that anymore. Those who heard him preach, they said he's preaching the faith he once sought to destroy. That's the old life, sought to destroy. That's the new him, preaching the faith. Big change. We've made big changes too. <laughs> He see, he was unfruitful in his prior life, and hence he made a turnaround. And I mean U-turn, back the other direction. Likewise, we could, this is how we can see, describe our former lives. Unfruitful. Nothing good. The words of Jesus still ring true. Without me, you can do nothing. So why then would you want to go back to such a life? The Spirit reasons. When, we, when we're in Christ, we're going exceedingly, why would anyone want to go back to their stale, fruitless, lifeless past life. By pondering this question, we see the inevitable. There is no rational reason for any believer to go back to sin. I mean, just reason it out. What can I gain from this? You, you know what the fruit is. I mean, it says in the text, the end of those things is death. Just reason it out. Is there a just cause, a reasonable cause to go back to my former life, to leave this life and go back? You can't. There is no reason. It, it, just, it goes against spiritual logic itself. And on another note, there is no rational reason to not be righteous. You can't build a case against that either. You can't reason like K. 
Can I get to God without it? No. You have to have that to get to God. It's a must. It's a necessity. Righteousness is a necessity in the kingdom. We see this result. Christ is better. That's what you're going to get every time when you can contrast the two. Being in Christ is better Amen. than being without him. My life outside Christ, it doesn't compare to the life that I have in Christ. Not even close. I do say this in light of things I hear said today. This is why it's so silly to have such a large emphasis on what we used to be. You know, sometimes people like to talk about their past crimes, their past offenses. And it almost sounds like they're bragging about it. They're like, oh, you wouldn't believe what I used to do. I did, yada, yada. Oh, ho, ho, but wait till you hear what I did. You think that's bad? Wait till you hear about this. I did this and this. Oh, that's nothing. I used to, you know, it sounds like a bragging contest. We're going to brag about this? Really? I suppose some people do this to show the greatness of their deliverance, but this, making this a focus is just flawed to the core. Why would you want to focus on the worst, darkest, most vile part of your life? This is the part of your life you're ashamed of. Yeah. Think about it. When you're ashamed of something, you normally don't want to have that thing broadcast to the world because of the reproach and embarrassment it's going to cause. Shh, don't tell anybody that. That's what people are like. But then they boast about their past sins. Now, G Paul did say, you know, like I persecuted the church of God, but he didn't like go into graphic details here. Oh, you wouldn't believe what I did to some of these Christians. I did this to that person. That. He didn't do that. He summarized it. He, and we had this too. We had these, these summarized statements. You were dead. That's enough. You were without Christ in the world. That's enough. You, have, you see, you have things like that. There's not like these details given. Now, but in Christ, though, it's good to give details. It is. We, I mean, we praise God that people are delivered from sin, but what, what you are in Christ is so much greater than what you were when you were in the world. So in Christ should be the focus. In Christ. What am I in Christ? That's the stuff we like to hear. I mean, I used to be a lot of things. I did. But what I am now is much more pleasing to hear about. That's a much sounder to hear. Sometimes they, they, people can watch videos like this the whole time. Ugh. Ugh. Well, see, it's like watching a horror film, you know, if you talk about your past life. It's just grueling, it's grisly, it's hard on the stomach. No, let's see the good stuff. Let's see the good stuff that's good to the eye, good to the ear. Make you want to come back and see it again, you know. That's the kind of stuff we want to emphasize. So in Christ, you're always going to be happy when you hear what you are in Christ and what your brethren are in Christ. That's always going to bring joy to the brethren. That is always a better focus. The verse following our main passage makes a very good declaration. It says that we've been made free from sin and made servants to God. Now, that's an interesting thought to consider. I'm free and I'm a servant. Many people can't see the, they can't see the change. Either you're, either you're a servant or you're free. Well, knowing Christ, you're free and you're a servant. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be a servant of the Lord. I'm glad to be freed from sin that I once lived in. And the passage states that we now have our fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And what that means is that my life in Christ, it produces holiness. I know there is a lot, a lot of vain talk about holiness, but holiness that's produced in Christ, it's far from being fake. Amen. The branches really do bear fruit when they're connected to the, to the true vine. They really are. It's not that we just start doing good, pleasant things, but that, that we have holiness in our nature, which naturally brings out works that please the Lord. So this shows the absurdity of returning to our past life when we see the, when we see the greatness of our new life. Earlier, I talked about how some people focus on the details of their past. It's good to focus on new life you have now. Yeah. I have everlasting life. That's a good thing to make Amen. known. I have everlasting life. Mm. Say that with confidence. I have peace with God. We have fellowship. Yeah. Me and God have fellowship. Yeah. See, that's good to share that. Yeah. You see, I've been forgiven of my sins. He has washed away my sins. God. Good detail. Good detail. You see, I don't, I, don't, I don't crave things that offend God. I crave things above. Yeah, that's where my interest is. Yeah, I trust this the same with you. I'm not alienated from God anymore. I'm connected, to the, I'm connected to Christ, and now God looks on me with favor. Amen. Yes. The Son of God's come. He's given us an understanding. I have a hope that doesn't disappoint. I'm justified by faith. I've been chosen unto salvation before the foundation of the world. My name's written down in heaven. Praise the Lord. Jesus prepares a place for us. Jesus is coming back to take us to himself, present us faultless and blameless before the Lord our God. That's how he's going to present me to God, blameless and faultless. 
See you there. <laughs> We're going to spend eternity with our God. See, these are details I like to hear about. Amen. When I look at all of my former life, I think the same thing that Paul wrote at the beginning of Romans chapter 6. How shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? That's just what I think when I look at it. You look at what you have now, you look at that, and it's just like, what's there to go back to? <laughs> what fruits do I have then? It's a rhetorical question. There's nothing there. There's nothing to go back to. It's better here. There's an, it, just, it shows you the absurdity. Like, you have that throughout Romans chapter 6. Like, how shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer than any? It's like, shall we continue in sin because we're no longer under law but under grace? You see that. There's, there's this case being built. It's, there, it's, there's no point in going back to sin. It's absurd to go back to sin when you have Jesus. Amen. You can't have Jesus and build a valid case for going back. It's just not there. In view of these good things, I would have to say it would be pretty stupid for me to go back to a life where no fruit was produced. Christ offers things so much better than the world has to offer, and thankfully we know this by experience too. While in the, See, people in the world, they've forsaken homes, families, lands, occupations in order to serve Christ. And why should it be any different for me? Why shouldn't I have to give up for Christ, as others have, as Christ requires? You've made that transition from death to life. That's a wonderful thing to consider. But to choose to go from life back to death and destruction, I would say that would be most stupid for any believer to do that. And stupid is a good word in this case. That would be a stupid thing to do. That's, what, that's my conclusion. There is no just cause. The end of those things is death. I choose life in Christ. Amen.